Okay, we're live. Today's class is going to be a little different than our regular classes. It's not going to be as upbeat as we normally are used to. Um, it's obviously a different type of day. And I think that's the main reason why I decided last minute to do this class is in order that we could all understand the day in which we are observing today. As we know, and we always say, Tisha B'Av, what Tisha B'Av actually means, what does that mean to us? Why are we observing this day? Why are we fasting? What is allowed and not allowed today? So many questions are jumbling through our minds. So first I'd like to excuse everyone for uh, my hoarse voice. I lost my voice over the past two days and uh, as I said this morning when I spoke at the synagogue, maybe it goes with the theme of the day. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted me to deliver this, these messages, the messages of Tisha B'Av in a less charismatic voice, in a more undertone. So with the help of, with, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, let's, let's start. <clears throat> I have a couple notes I have jotted down over here that I was gonna go through a couple important topics roughly around 10 topics I want to discuss. And um, let's start. Let's start by first understanding what happened on Tish Abiyav. Does everyone hear me well? Uh, Gabriel, at least do you guys hear me? I see you. Yeah, good. Okay, let's bring the mic a little closer. Is it good? Is it clear? Okay. What happened on Tish Abiyav? <clears throat> Why are we observing what we're observing? What are we mourning for? So there was, as the Talmud explains, the Rambam, many of our commentaries, they all tell us that there are five main things that happened on Tisha B'Av. And these are the five things which forms this day to be a day of sadness, a day of mourning, a day of introspection. The first, we're gonna go in order of chronology. Sorry, I'm just looking at my screen back and forth. I keep on adding people joining to the class. In chronology, the first thing that happened today was back in 1312 BCE. That's a long time ago. And this was a year after the Jewish people left Egypt, a little more than a year. There was the grave sin of the spies, the Miraglim. The spies went out into the land of Israel, one from each tribe, they all came back with a negative report. It's kind of fresh in our minds because we've learned about this quite recently. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu sees the reply of the Jewish people, their response to the negative report and they overdid their response and they cried and they cried and they wept. And unfortunately HaKadosh Baruch Hu looked at that and said, if you wept for no reason today, I will make sure to give you this day desecrated, designated as a day for weeping forevermore. And this is what started off all of the downward spiral of all the horrible tragedies that took place on this day, on the day of Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. That's the first, the sin of the spies. The second happened with the destruction of the temple, the destruction of the first temple with which in Jewish the Jewish calendar, the Jewish years happened in the year 3,338. The first temple, just so that we understand a little, stood for 410 years. It was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire, led by Nebuchadnezzar, not a very famous name, the infamous Nebuchadnezzar, ruthless, ruthless tyrant. And over 100,000 Jews were killed with the destruction of the first temple, along with millions exiled, millions upon millions exiled to all over the world. So this happened a very, very long time ago. Let me pull up my calculator just so I put this in. If we are this year, 5781 minus 3338, this, the destruction of the first temple took place 2,443 years ago. That's a long time. Now let's fast forward to the third calamity, the third tragedy that happened 
for the Jewish people on Tisha B'Av, and that was the destruction of the second temple. The second temple was destroyed. Let's do this. 5871. Sorry. 5781 minus the destruction of the temple was in 3828. And that gives us 1953. This year we are observing 1953 years from the destruction of the second temple. And the second temple was not destroyed by the Babylonians, rather it was destroyed by the Romans, led by Titus. And there, two million Jews, opposed to 100,000 Jews that passed away in, in the first, uh, that were killed and murdered in the first destruction. The second temple, two million Jews were murdered and over a million Jews were exiled. Very, very hard for the Jewish people to, to recover after such a, such a tragedy, such a calamity. That's the second. So again, the first was the spies, the Medaglim. The second was the destruction of the first temple. And then the third um, calamity was the destruction of the second temple. Later on, around 75 years after the destruction of the second temple, there was the Beitar massacre to the point where the Talmud explains that the streets were flowing like rivers of blood of the Jewish people down the mountains through the streets. A horrible, sad, sad thing. Over 100,000 Jews were killed. Seems not as grave and tragic as the second and the third or even the first three calamities that took place. But nevertheless, since it happened on the same day, we attribute this day to be a day of sadness and mourning. Furthermore, a little past that, Turnus Rufus plowed the temple area where the Beit HaMikdash stood he plowed it flat. So these five calamities is what brought the Jewish people from back then until today, almost 2,000 years of mourning year after year on the very same day for these calamities. Just as a, a bonus, a bo bonus calamities that the Jewish people endured during this time, unfortunately, was ironically the 1492 Spanish Inquisition expulsion took place on Tisha B'Av, as well as the breakout of World War I in 1914, when Germany declared war against Russia, as well as World War II in 1942, where the deportation began to Warsaw and Treblinka. So these are all very, very sad things that took place on this day. Of course, we were mourning, and, and, and these were days of sorrow before these latter three. Nevertheless, these three happened on the same day, and we always, traditionally, the Jewish people took this day <clears throat> as a day of caution, as a day of mourning, as a day of prayer, as a day of introspection, as a day to stop from everything we are always running after and being busy with, and even, even for the very fact of doing mitzvot and learning Torah and teaching Torah. This day is a day, it's 24, 25 hour period, which part of it we sleep anyways, where we set aside to just contemplate the sadness, the sorrow, the missing, the lacking of the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, that we do not have anymore. So with that thought, I want to move into my next short topic. So that was the first short topic. Again, for those of you who jumped on later, this we just went through the main five reasons why we observe Tisha B'Av, the sadness that happened, the spies, the two temples, Betar, destruction, and then the plowing of the temple. And then we had the Spanish Inquisition, World War I, World War II. Now I want to go into why is it so difficult for you, for I, for all of us, to connect or even relate to the idea of losing a Bet HaMikdash. At first glance, our very first feelings and thoughts are, we never experienced the temple. The closest thing any of us has ever experienced to the Bet HaMikdash was going and visiting the Kotel. And then taking that beautiful Baal Hashem, we even have that, that beautiful tunnel tour with a couple movies and clips of animations 
And then they even have these model Beit HaMikdashis, how they show the first temple, and then its destruction, and then how they rebuilt the second temple, and then its destruction, and where we are today, and where you're actually standing at that point. Very meaningful, but still out of touch. Still so far from the real thing. And this, I believe, is why it is so difficult for us to connect to something that we never saw. I want to share with you a true story that my dear friend actually saw him this, this past week, Mr. Barry Reichenberg. I met him and his son this week. And, and I remember years ago, he sent me an email of this true story. So, so true, so sad, and will teach us this lesson so strongly. There was once a husband and wife who were waiting years to conceive. Finally, the wife conceived and they were joyous. They were so happy. Nine months to term and the wife is sitting in the hospital about to deliver. And unfortunately, there was some type of medical complication and the doctor is in and out and in and out and the nurse is back and forth. Papers being passed around, secrets being said. Finally, the doctor asks everyone to leave and speaks to the husband and the wife alone. And he is about to present them with the hardest decision they're ever going to have to make in their lives. And that is, the doctor looks at the two of them and says, unfortunately, the situation is not so positive. The bad news is that someone is not going to make it. The good news is at least one of you are going to make it. So he turns to the husband and wife and says, it's either the baby or the mommy. One of them will survive. One of them will not make it. And after tears and tears, the mother looks at the husband and says, I am willing to sacrifice myself for this new life, for this new child. I know it's going to be hard for you, hard for the child. But if it's a boy... Please promise me that every year on my death anniversary, on my yard site, that you personally will take this child from when he's bar mitzvah and bring him to the synagogue to say Kaddish for me, to elevate my soul. And with those words, the husband tearing, tearing, couldn't control his emotions, promised his wife that he would adhere to that promise. And so it was the mother passed away with the birth. The child lived and was ha healthy, and it was a boy. Can you imagine? 13 years old, it was a bittersweet moment. On one hand, the child has reached this milestone. On the other hand, there's no mommy to celebrate. And then on the first year of the yard site of his mother, the father brings the boy to read Kaddish. The boy learned in Hebrew school how to read the Kaddish. And the boy is reading the Kaddish and the father pays attention and sees no emotion, no feeling at all. And he was so bothered. He was so, so, so baffled. And he looked at the boy and he said, I don't understand something. Your mother gave up her life for you and asked for one thing and one thing only that on her yard site, you make a Kaddish. Why are you doing it like you don't care or like it means nothing to you? So the son looked at his father, innocent 13 year old. You can't expect anything more than innocence at this age. And the boy looks at his father and says, Tati, it's so hard for me to muster up or have any feelings for someone I never knew that never held me, that I was never raised by. And the lesson of this story is so true to us. We never walked in the Bet HaMikdash. We never viewed the Kohen Gadol in his service. All the Kohanim and the Levi'im in their singing and then their preparations and then their service to the Bet HaMikdash. Like that 13-year-old boy, it's so hard for us to connect when we say our prayers in our, in our Amidar Sand prayer, it's full of alluding to the Bet HaMikdash and the service in the Bet HaMikdash. We, we praise, we bless Hashem. Please return your Shekhinah, your presence to Zion, 
to Jerusalem, to the temple. Let it be known. Let it be evident to all. We say the bracha of Baruch Atah Hashem, Boneh Yerushalayim, please Hashem, rebuild it, Jerusalem. It's destroyed now. Yes, there's tourism. Yes, we're able to go and visit. We're able to see. But the city is dead compared to the way it was in its glory. Do we understand what that means? In all honesty, we don't. And that's our problem. That's why it's so hard for us to connect. But with that introduction, I want to ponder upon a couple ideas that may give us some sense of reality and connection, that we're able to muster up some emotion, some feelings for something we never truly witnessed with our own eyes. As Chazal tell us, our sages tell us, the only way to get closer to something or to create feelings for, for something that you cannot witness in person. How do you create a closest to Hashem? How do you get closer to Hashem, someone that you cannot feel and see and touch? It's by learning about Him. It's by learning about what He left us. HaKadosh Baruch Hu left us the greatest gift, the divine wisdom, the Torah. Through studying Torah, the Rambam says, we get closer to Hashem. Through pondering on science and nature, we get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Guess what? We get to know Him better. Him, Hashem, in His infinite ways, in His divine calculations, something so far from our finite brains that we're able to understand. We're able to draw closer to that through studying Torah and through pondering that which He gave us, nature, science, the human body. So with that concept, maybe through learning more about the Bet HaMikdash, the lack of the Bet HaMikdash, what caused the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, maybe through that we're going to be able to develop some type of connection, some type of emotion, some feelings that we may not have had. I want to start off with a, <clears throat> a parable, a mashal that's given by one of the great masters of parables in, throughout Jewish literature, and that's the Magid Miduvna. The Magid Miduvna, he writes of a minhag, he says that at every wedding, every Jewish wedding, there's a great celebration. It's a happy time. At every wedding and at most happy times, like a brit milah even, a circumcision, we always quote as a part of the ceremony, a very, very famous verse from Tehillim. King David writes in Psalms chapter 137, Im Hashem, it's like, a, it's like a, a lamentation to Hashem. If I forget Jerusalem, oh, I should forget the strength of my right hand. Meaning there's nothing that's ever going to bring me to a place of forgetting the glorious, mighty, miraculous, beautiful Jerusalem. Nothing can ever get me to there. And the Maki Miduvna asks, why is it that we have to mention the Horban, the destruction of the temple, in the times of our joy? I mean, it's such a glorious, joyous time at a wedding, at a brit milah. We're going to mention now the time of our sadness. He gives the parable of a newcomer who comes to a brand new city. He knows absolutely no one there except for one person, the mayor. And because he felt like, even though he knew nobody, he knew the mayor, he felt very comfortable and he was treating people maybe not with the utmost respect. So amongst the citizens of the city, they came together and said, no one is going to sell this gentleman the house and no one is going to sell him land within the city limits in order that he could build a house. They made this silent deal between all of them. 
And so it was, the newcomer went from door to door, from neighbor to neighbor, citizen to citizen, nobody sold him no land, no house, nothing. He found himself up against the wall. He didn't know what to do. The Magid says, this man went and he found himself open, free and clear land between two mountains. And he built himself the most glorious home. Five floors high, tall ceilings, beautiful tapestries and furniture and furnishings and everything. Every single time the citizens of the city would walk by this newcomer's house, they would all smirk and giggle. Until finally the newcomer wanted an explanation. Why is it that everyone is so, so mocking my new house? This is greater than anything they've ever seen. Finally, one of the citizens told them, you know, you built this beautiful home. Indeed, it's remarkable. We, our city has never seen anything like it. But just so you know, your home is built on a lake that is frozen. And very, very soon, when the season will change, your beautiful home will, as, will also melt with the ice and vanish as if it was never. The lesson the Magid Miduvna tells us is that the Jewish people, when we are in Israel, but not just Israel the way it is today, not from 1948 and on, but from over 2,000 years ago, from when the time of the temple, the Bet HaMikdash, we were so close to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Something that was just felt by all. And anything the Jewish people did in the land of Israel at that time, they felt a clear blessing from Hashem in an open way. It was evident to all. Any happiness and success nowadays, unfortunately, says the Magid Miduvna, has no true foundation. It's like building a mansion on an ice lake. We mention the Hurban, we mention the destruction of the temple today by our joyous occasions and our happy times to remind us that there's no clear happiness. Our mouths, as King David writes, our mouths cannot be full of laughter until Mashiach comes, until the Bet HaMikdash is rebuilt. We mention this at, the, at these happy times so we remind ourselves, yes, we have a joyous time. We're marrying off our children. We're doing a Brit Milah. We're continuing in our ways, our heritage, our tradition. But we cannot be 100% completely happy because we're not there yet. We still need to be working towards bringing back the Bet HaMilash. And until the Bet HaMilash is not back, we will always have that chip on our shoulders, that faulty foundation that there will never be a complete happiness yet. So we have to remember everything we build in Chutz Laaretz, our schools, our homes, our synagogues, our schools, they're there to serve a function, an important one, granted. But that function is momentary. It is temporary. And it is only there to serve as a vehicle to hopefully get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu through studying Torah, fulfilling mitzvot, and through hastening the rebuilding of the Third Temple, because until then we're going to be fully empty. It's going to be a full glass that is just emptying constantly with the crack at the bottom. And this leads us to understanding, so what brought the destruction of the temples? Such horrible calamities. What actually made that happen? The Talmud tells us that the first temple was destroyed because the Jewish people were engaging in the three cardinal sins. The first is murder. The second is idolatry. And the third is adultery. Murder, killing another. Whether there's a reason or no reason, in any other way than self-defense, it's considered 
murder. Idolatry in any form, turning towards another god or deity, putting your trust in something else other than Hashem is a form of idolatry even. And adultery, the, the unimaginable of a couple cheating on one another, the, the, the bond and unity of a husband and wife and the loyalty that is supposed to be kept and then that being broken. These three sins that were unfortunately rampant during that time is what settled the decree for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to say the temple is going to be destroyed. Now comes the Talmud and says, these three sins, just so you know, are the only three sins you are obligated to give your life up for if forced to commit. Meaning, if somebody, obviously not a healthy person, not a God-fearing person, will come up to you and they will point the gun at you and say, go and murder that person. You are supposed to give up your life and not pull the trigger to kill someone else. Go and worship that idol. You're supposed to give up your life. You're not supposed to. You are obligated to give up your life and not commit idolatry. If someone comes and points a gun at you and says, go do something inappropriate with that other man's wife, you are supposed to give up your life then to do that. These are the only three sins. When forced, when being forced, you have to die for and not commit. That means if someone would come up to you and say, I'm going to take your life if you do not eat pork. You eat the pork. I'm going to take your life if you don't eat on Yom Kippur. You're to eat on Yom Kippur and not give up your life. I'm going to take your life if you don't steal. You steal. Maybe you come back after and you make up for it. You do Teshuvah. You'll pay the back guy back another way. But you don't give up your life except for these three cardinal sins. The Talmud says, as severe as those three sins were, the destruction of the second temple took place because of what is called in Hebrew, sinat hinam, loosely translated as baseless hatred. Because there was a lack of unity and peace and there was rampant baseless hatred. The second temple was taken down. Can you imagine the first temple was taken down on the three most severe sins. And this one sin that could seemingly not even be detected amongst outsiders is what took down the second temple in all its glory. So in order to understand what baseless hatred means, the Talmud goes on for pages, a couple pages in the fifth pedic of Masechet Gitin to give us some examples of baseless hatred or other severe and, and very hard episodes that took place before the destruction of the second temple, which brought to the destruction of the second temple. And the first story the Talmud brings us is a famous story, a heart-wrenching story named as the, the Talmud says, the temple was destroyed because of Kamtsa Ubar Kamtsa, Mr. Kamtsa and Mr. Bar Kamtsa. So what really happened in this story? So I'll tell you the story on face value the way the Talmud says it, and I want to give you an interpretation that the Benish High offers that maybe brings it more, more to life for us and makes it maybe very applicable. <clears throat> and hopefully we could learn from it. There was an unnamed man in the Talmud. We don't know who this person was. He had a sworn enemy. Can you imagine that this unnamed man was one time in a business dealing with Bar Kamtsa 20 years ago? 
and this fellow Barkamtsa ripped him off so bad that he wasn't even, he couldn't find it within him to find a way to forgive him. And came the day that this unnamed man was marrying off his daughter. And he had a feast, a great hatuna, a great wedding festival. And he sent his messengers to go and invite everybody around town. And he even told him, go and invite this one and that one and this one and that one. And he told him, don't forget to invite my good friend, Kamtsa. So the messenger misheard who his good friend was. The messenger went to Bar Kamtsa's house and invited him to the festivity. <clears throat> he invited him to the wedding. He was shocked. He knew that they were not maybe on great terms. Maybe he wants to make men's. Okay. So he comes to the wedding and all of the great sages were at the wedding. The rabbis, the teachers, the politicians, the friends. Everybody was at this wedding. It was literally a party to be at. And this unnamed man, the host, we'll call him the host from now on. The host is going and greeting all of the people that came to partake in his simcha, in this joyous occasion. Table by table saying hello and welcoming everyone, thanking them for coming. And he goes to one table and he, from the corner of his eye, he sees his arch enemy. He sees, he, he takes a double look, can it be? Can Bar Kamtsa have come to my wedding? I didn't invite him. What's going through his mind? He's probably coming to destroy this happiness, to ambush, to sabotage this joyous day for me. And he was furious. The host goes over to him and he demands him to leave at once. Bar Kamtsa said, listen, you're catching me off guard. I thought by you inviting me was a true act of kindness, but I'll, I'll, I'll pay for my meal. Just don't spare me the embarrassment of being thrown out. The host raises his voice. And that starts to become a commotion. He says, you leave at once. Bar Kamtsa didn't know where to put himself. He tells him, I'll pay for half the meal. All, half of all these expenses, it's on me. Just please, just let me stay. I'll stay in my corner. The host raises his voice. He says, you get out at once. And Bar Kamtsa one final time offers, I'll pay for the entire meal, the entire wedding. Just spare me this embarrassment in front of everybody. And the host takes Bar Kamtsa and he drags him out himself. Bar Kamtsa was so hurt from this, more than the fact that he was dragged out by his, by his ex-partner, by his arch enemy. But he was so angry that everyone else just stood and watched. So you know what he did? He went to the Roman legions and he said, he thought in his mind, if all of the great sages saw this, it must mean that what the host did was acceptable in their eyes. I'm going to teach them a lesson. And through his rage, he went to the Roman legions and he said, the Jewish people have rebelled against you. He said, how could that be? That never happens. We've been on great terms. Oh yeah, let's see. Don't you normally send sacrifices? Give me some animals. I'm going to go bring them and let's see if they accept your sacrifice. If they don't, it means that they are, they have rebelled. So it was the Romans sent three calves. And Bar Kamtsa very wittingly, in his evil way, he made a little slit in their, either in their, in their lip or in their eye to make a blemish. He brings it to the Jewish people and he says, Aha, what do we have here? We have three calves from the Romans. They want to 
take this as a they want they're offering this as a sacrifice at the temple like they always do you will surely bring it correct the rabbis examine the calves and they see that there's a blemish and they don't know what to do some of them say let's bring it up anyways because if we don't the romans are going to get wind of it and then there's going to be a war others say what are you talking about? We've never brought an animal that has a blemish on the altar. Let's just kill Bar Kamsa. He won't tell them. They'll never know. The other rabbis get up and say, how could that be? Rabbi Yohanan Kohen Gadol says, we cannot murder a man for bringing a blemished animal as an offering because then everyone's going to think the generations to come are going to think that anyone who brings a blemished animal as an offering, it's going to set a new standard that they need to die. And that's not true. They didn't know what to do. They didn't bring it up. But Kamsa returns to the Roman legions, snitches on them. And through that, he goes. And the downward spiral of... And through that, the downward spiral of the destruction of the temple took place. And this was all from a simple wedding that could have seemingly been avoided. A, a wedding tragedy that kind of never had to happen. Asks the Iyun Yaakov, he says, we call this the tragedy of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa that caused the destruction. Kamsa was never part of this story. It's like I tell you Jack and Jill. Because of Jack and Jill, the temple was destroyed. But the temple was really destroyed because of Jill, not because of Jack. So the Yun Yaakov wants to know, why is it that the Talmud says it's because of Mr. 1 and Mr. 2, Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, the temple was destroyed. Maybe you want to say it's because of the host and Bar Kamsa. Answers the Ben Ishchai. He says that Kamsa must have been at that wedding also. After all, the invitation was sent to Bar Kamsa, but I'm sure Kamsa, through word of mouth, heard it also, and he made it there. Kamsa was there, and he witnessed what was being done to his fellow, and he didn't get up in protest. He could have went over to the host and said, it's just a simple misunderstanding. The messenger brought the invitation to him instead of me. We have similar names. <clears throat> Let it go. Don't make such a commotion out of it. But he didn't. Says the Ben Ishchai, a deeper insight. This is heart-wrenching. Listen to this. The Ben Ishchai says, based on the Marsha, you know who these people were? The host is unnamed. Kamtsa is unnamed. It's not a very common name. It's a person. But Bar Kamtsa was the son of Kamtsa. And that means that the host's best friend was a fellow named Kamtsa. And you know who his arch enemy was, the host's arch enemy? Was Kamtsa's own son. Kamtsa knew the feud that was between his best friend and his son. And he didn't make peace. He didn't bring them together. Explains the Ben Ishchai. There's a common theme through this story. Whether it be Kamtsa, whether it be the sages or other politicians or other people at the wedding. The inaction, their apathy for what was being take, happening, for them allowing for such a terrible thing to take place brought on these consequences. 
in modern psychology, this passivity is referred to the bystander effect. And the bystander effect states that a person who just witnesses something and they don't do anything about it, they are held responsible for that very treason. Just being there at that wedding and not doing anything. Can you imagine? It's your own son, says the Ben Ishrei. And you are not taking action. Hashem saw this and he said, that's it, it's over. The hatred, the dislike that's taken place here is too much to bear. <clears throat> and the question is, this reason for apathy seems to contradict the Talmud in Masechet Yomah that tells us another reason for Sinat Hinam, another reason that the temple was destroyed for baseless hatred. It tells us that Sinat Hinam is not restricted to active hatred. It can also allude to just being MIA, missing in action. So again, the Talmud in Masechet Gitin tells us about this bystander effect. But the Talmud in Masechet Yoma tells us it was destroyed because of baseless hatred. So what is it? Is it, is it baseless hatred? Or the passivity of not taking action? Explains our sages, they are both the same. Hatred is not only, baseless hatred is not only come from an active hatred. Hatred is also find, found in a lack of action, in passivity. Let's go back to the first time we find hatred in our Torah. Can anyone try to guess? The first time, maybe you want to put in the chat if you thought of it. Where is the first time we find sinah, hatred, the word Sin'a, I'll give it a hint. Sin'u'a. So yes, Cain and Havel, there was Cain hated Hevel. But we don't see the Torah say that. Oh, very good. My mom put it in, very good. Le'ah was the first one to feel hated. By who? By who? Her husband Yaakov. Go back to Parashat Vayetze in the book of Genesis. Yaakov first married Leah. He was tricked into it. A week later, he married Dahel. The Torah tells us. I'll quote it to you. Vayad Hashem. God saw ki Leah. That Leah was hated. Hated by Yaakov Avinu. And what did he do because of that? Vaiftach et Rahma Virahel Akara. Hashem opened her womb, allowed her to conceive. Yes, as it's put in the chat, it was a complicated relationship. The relationship that Yaakov had with Rahel and with Leah was a very complicated one. But she felt hated. Hashem rewarded her and opened her womb. He favored Rahel and he closed her womb. How can we possibly understand Yaakov Avinu, our patriarch, as our sages say, our most perfect patriarch? He hated a person. Moreover, he hated his wife. The Ramban tells us a powerful answer. Listen up closely, my friends. The Ramban says, Chas v'shalom. Yaakov never hated Leah, but he had a weak level of love. His love was not complete for Leah. Now, we can't really blame Yaakov for that because after all, he was tricked into marrying her 
thinking he was marrying someone else. But because he had a weaker level of love for Leah, she felt hated. Hashem considered that as hatred. A lack of love, lack of compassion. Hashem says that's hatred. So Sinah doesn't need a mean active hatred, boiling blood towards someone. It also includes the lack of care and love for someone. Rav Yonatan Eibeshitz tells us, he takes it a little further. He says Sinat Hinam can also qualify as the disinterest in someone else. And my son, uh, Yaakov, will be on in a moment. His video froze. Please stand by. Okay, sorry about that. Does everyone hear me? I don't know. I guess uh, the Satan attacked my, my, my Wi-Fi and my internet's down at home. Okay, let me, let's continue. Yeah, does everyone hear me? Okay, sorry about that. If it connects back on my computer, I'll let you know. <clears throat> okay, so let's carry on from where we were. <clears throat> I wanted to share a, another interpretation to what baseless hatred is, to what Sinat Hinam is. <clears throat> and that is the very, very holy words of Rab Nisim Yagen, Zechuto Yagen Alenu, one of the great rabbis from the previous generation. And <clears throat> he writes, Okay, I'm back on. Okay, does everyone hear me? Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what happened. Okay, really sorry about that. Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, so I wanted to share with you from Reb Nisim Yagen. <clears throat> Reb Nisim Yagen says, baseless hatred is the amount of hatred that we deliver or we feel for someone that's unwarranted. What does that mean? That means if someone does something wrong to you, 
you have a natural tendency to dislike them or hate them for a certain amount. But when you take that out of whack, when you take that up over the top, when you make it so much, so much more than it really is, that's baseless hatred. So for example, the, the story, the, 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 the scenario I always give, someone cuts you off when you're driving and you start screaming at them and then they, they give you the middle finger. Then you cut them off. Then they catch up to you. They pull over and they shoot the person. Chas shalom. Is that not something that escalated way out of whack? Of course it is. That's not, not, not imaginable that someone's life should be taken because of an altercation of cutting off on, on the road. Come on. That's baseless hatred. Baseless hatred is when something is taken so out, like something small took place and it was exploded to be something so much worse. And because of that, they're not invited to your parties anymore, to your smahot, your kids are not allowed to play together, your wives are not allowed to talk together. If he's crossing, he's walking down the street, you're not going to walk down anywhere near him. Baseless hatred is when you have somewhat of a valid reason to dislike someone, but you take it way further than it is. That's what Hashem can't stand. Now, yes, he can't stand any, any signs of hatred or dislike, of course. But a Kadosh Baruch Hu says when you go out of it, you out of your mind and, and so, in something that's so not, not valid and you overdo it, that's baseless hatred. And the fact that the temple is still not here is because we are still following in those ways. <clears throat> so that's the idea of sinat hinam, baseless hatred. Now I want to just review the five prohibitions that we do on Tisha B'Av that we observe. And then there's a, another six that tag along. So hear me out on them. The first and the main five are all derived from the laws of Yom Kippur. There are five prohibitions on Yom Kippur. These are the exact same five on Tisha B'Av. The first is no eating and drinking. The second is you're not allowed to bathe or wash yourself in any way unless you got dirty. The third is, is you're not allowed to anoint yourself with any oil, perfume, can't brush your teeth, rinse your mouth out, none of that. Fourth is you're not allowed to wear leather shoes, only leather. So if you have any other type of shoe, even though they may be comfortable, it's only leather shoes. <clears throat> and the fifth is no marital relations. These are the five things that you're not allowed to do on Yom Kippur. These are the five things that we don't do on Tisha B'Av. On Yom Kippur, we don't do them to, as the Torah says, to afflict ourselves. And that affliction propels us to a place of atonement and repentance and prayer. Today, it's for a different reason. It's for to impose affliction upon ourselves, but for the sake of mourning. There's another five things that we're not to do on Yom Kippur, on, on uh, six, sorry, on, on Tisha B'Av. One is, is that we have to make a change in the way we sleep. So if we normally sleep with two pillows, it's one pillow. If it's one pillow, it's no pillows or a thinner pillow. Some people take their mattress and they put it on the ground. Some don't. But make some type of change in your sleep. Next is that we sit on the floor from last night until midday, until around 1.26 today, at least in Florida time. You're not allowed to work. Number three, we don't work on Tisha B'Av. Unless someone's going to lose their job and they absolutely have no other way to feed themselves and have a, have a livelihood, you're not allowed to work on Tisha B'Av. Because when you're working on, when you're doing any other type of work, you're preoccupying yourself with something other than what this day was dedicated for. You're not allowed to go and take a stroll. Just go and Go and, 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 I don't know, go to, to the zoo or to a park. Of course, if you're babysitting your kids or whatnot. <clears throat> but if it's just to just to take a leisurely stroll, it's not something that's done today. 
You're not allowed to learn Torah on Tisha B'Av. That's number five. You're only allowed to learn things about the temple, about the destruction of the temple, or related to repentance and Teshuvah. And number six is you're not allowed to give a greeting to somebody. You can't say hello, you can't say hi, you can't say how's it going. Because as anyone who's ever truly experienced, when they're in mourning, it's not something that matters to them. They're just down. Today's supposed to be a down day, a bummer day, as they say. That's the type of day it is. It's a day that we're just supposed to be thinking about Hashem, thinking about the temple, thinking about what it is to be without it. On that note, I want to share with you something fascinating from the Arizal. See, the Arizal never wrote anything. Everything was written by his by his uh, faithful disciple, Rav Haim Vital. And in Shara Kavanot, I'll open up, I'll show you what it looks like. Shara Kavanot, this is one of the books. There's 13 volumes that are as, referred to as the Kitve Arizal, the writings of the Arizal. <clears throat> in this volume called Shara Kavanot, where it speaks about the holidays, it speaks about a lot about our, our daily, weekly, and holiday rituals. He has one little paragraph, it's not even half a page. Just to show you this amount right over here, from here to here. He has one little paragraph on Tisha B'Av. He has many other parts on, on, on Pesach. It's pages and pages and, and Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot and pages. Tisha B'Av, he has one little thing. One little paragraph. So I'll share it with you. Briefly, as, as he's brief himself. He says that there's a minhag in the afternoon. That means after noontime on Tisha B'Av. To, everyone should get up and sit on their chairs as we're doing now. No more sitting on the floor. If you see someone sitting on the floor now, you got to tell them get up. Only till midday do we sit on the floor. Why is that? Well, the Arizal continues, says, not only do we get up and we sit on the, get, get up from the floor, sit on chairs, we should also read verses of Nechama, verses of consolation, as we will do in Mincha. We have the haftara for Mincha is one of Nechamav, consolation. He asks, why is it that from midday and on on Tisha B'Av do we lighten the load of our, of our mourning? Seemingly, according to the Talmud, from midday and on, it got worse for the Jewish people. From midday and on on Tisha B'Av, the temple itself was being burnt. How can we lighten our load? There's a tradition that's brought down in many sefarim, many holy books, that from midday and on, the houses, the woman of the house should start tidying up the house, cooking, preparing for the meal to break the fast from midday and on. Darizal says, why all of these things? Why are we, are we, are we desensitizing the severity of the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash from midday and on, if that's when the temple itself, the Kodesh HaKodashim was being burnt. And he gives two answers. The Arizal's first answer is that the Jewish people saw that they themselves were suffering. Many Jews, as we said, were being killed. And they were getting worried. They were brought back to the memory that they knew of, of the explanation we all know today of why Moshe Rabbeinu did not enter the land of Israel. Do we know why? We remember. Moshe Rabbeinu was decreed not to enter the land of Israel for our sake. Because if Moshe Rabbeinu would have built the temple... Hashem would have never able to destroy the temple if and when the Jewish people themselves will turn away from God and they would need to be punished. If that would have happened, if Moshe Rabbeinu would have built the temple, Hashem would have had to take out the punishment of the Jewish people, the wrath on us, and completely destroy us. 
Instead, Hashem said, Moshe Rabbeinu will not build a, the temple. The temple will be, the first one will be built by King Solomon, and that will be destroyed and not the Jewish people. So the Jewish people, that is us, were worried. They were dying. Many of them were dying. But as soon as they saw the temple go up in flames, a certain part of them became happy. Happy? What? Darisal says they were happy. They were relieved because they said, now we see Hashem is really letting His wrath out on the sticks and stones of the temple and not on the Jewish people, just as He promised. So in order to commemorate this feeling of relief the Jewish people had, this feeling that they knew that they would not be completely annihilated and destroyed. From midday and on, from when the fire broke out in the temple, is when we already lighten our load of mourning from midday and on. Another short reason why he says it's a little more happy or consoling from midday and on is because the Midrash tells us on Tisha B'Av, on the ninth of Av, Mashiach will be born and his name will be Menachem. Menachem means to console us. So since this is the time when, the afternoon of Tisha B'Av, since this is the time when Menachem is supposed to be born, the Mashiach, therefore we already are in a different mood, in a different mode. And that's where the Minhag, the tradition of Naming a child Menachem, if they're born on Tisha B'Av, comes from hoping that they can be the Mashiach. <clears throat> I have two more short things I want to share. I know it's been an hour now. If you have somewhere to go, if you have another class to listen to or watch, please do. I'm going to continue for <clears throat> a couple more moments. The Talmud in Masechet Ta'anit tells us, page 30b, that anyone who mourns over the destruction of Jerusalem will have the merit to rejoice when it's going to be rebuilt. It seems that only those who really, really feel the mourning and the suffering and the lack of Jerusalem will have the merit to rejoice. And why is that? Why can't we say that anyone who fulfills Torah and mitzvot can rejoice when Jerusalem is rebuilt? When the Mashiach comes, the temple's rebuilt. Why is it selected to only those who mourned for the destruction of Jerusalem that will rejoice when it's rebuilt? Rabbi Pincus tells us, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, he answers through a mashal, through an anecdote. He says, walk into a wedding, paint the following picture, walk into a wedding during the dancing, everyone's at the dance floor, everyone's dancing full of joy, energy, nothing but happiness. The groom, the family members, the friends, distant connection, no one knows really who's who. If you would walk into a wedding and not know who the groom is, not know who the father of the groom is, the father-in-law, the siblings, the best friends, you wouldn't really know who's who in the middle of everyone dancing. It's kind of hard. And the reason he explains why it's hard to is because when people are expressing joy, it's kind of like anybody's able to express joy. Everyone's able to come and react and start dancing and no one really will know who's who. But when it comes to mourning, mourning is different. That scene of a mourning home, as soon as you walk into a Bet Avel, mourner's home, right away you know who the mourner is. A stranger can walk into the wedding hall and be kind of lost, not know who's who, and just start dancing even. But when you walk into a mourner's home, everyone's quiet. And everyone knows where the mourner is. Most of the time, it's the mourner that's doing most of the talking. That's the way it should be. Rapinka says, it's easy to rejoice through learning Torah and fulfilling mitzvot. It's geschmack, as we say in Yiddish. It's 
come together and do the seder, to grab the arbat haminim and go in the sukkah, Purim, Chanukah. It's fun. It's good to come to a Torah class, to come out with novelties, understanding why we do what we do, how we do it. That's fun. It's easy to rejoice then. Simhat Torah, the synagogue's full. From the whole time. Yom Kippur, eh, there's not too many people. Tisha B'Av, not too many people. There's only for the important parts. But it's easy to rejoice. A stronger connection to Hashem or to anyone, but specifically here to Hashem, is to mourn and to lament over the fact that Hashem and B'nai Israel lost the Bet HaMikdash. Rapinka says that's why the mourners over the temple will rejoice in Mashiach, because they understood the agenda. They, understood, they got the memo. They understood that when it was hard to connect, they connected. Not only when it's easy. How do you know who your friends are? You know your friends. You know who your friends are when you're struggling, when you're down, when you're on the floor. When you're all scraped up and you're bleeding. That's how you know who's committed to you and who's loyal to you. And who cares about you? Hashem in the Beit Hamikdash is the same way. Yeah, when it's going to be built, everyone's going to come. All the nations of the world are going to come and claim to bring sacrifices. Claim it's theirs. Claim it's they want a part in it too. Hashem's going to look for the only ones, the few who mourned for its destruction year after year for two thousand years. Hashem is going to look and say, they are the ones who it belongs to. And to finish off with one last point, to wrap it up with this week's parasha, we just read yesterday, parashat devarim. Just so you know, parashat devarim is always read before Tisha B'Av. Moshe gets up and he rebukes the Jewish people for all of the trouble they caused him over the past 40 years. 36 days before he passes away, he's going and he's giving his speech. The question is, these people who he's rebuking are not the ones who sinned. 40 years have passed. It's the new generation. This is the children and grandchildren of all those people who faulted. What's he doing? Says the Svatimet, every generation is obligated to repair the sins of the previous generations. And if they don't rectify them and repair them, by default, they are going to be following in their footsteps and making the very same mistakes. So he says a very powerful concept, the Svatimet. If you want to benefit from a concept that we call Zechut Avot, Zechut Avot means merit of our ancestors. If you want to have what we call schut avot, merit of your fathers and your grandfathers, well, you also have to take responsibility for their sins, for their faults. And if you follow in their ways, unfortunately, you're not taking that responsibility. Well, Shed Abena was teaching them a powerful lesson. If you do not better your ways, if you do not actively change the course of the mistakes of your previous generations, you will go down the same path and make the same mistakes. This falls in line perfectly with what the Gemara tells us, that every generation that the temple is not rebuilt, it's as if it was destroyed. That means that we have to see ourselves as the fault and cause of the temple not being rebuilt. We indeed are responsible. We need to better our ways, say our sages. Moshe is rebuking them to make sure they don't make the same mistakes and fix, their, fix the faults of their parents. We have to look at the faults of what caused the temple and say we need to fix that. The way to fix Sinat Hinam, baseless hatred, 
is ahavat hinam, loving others for no good reason. Now, based on what we said, how do you just go up to someone and love them for no reason? Is it going up to someone and just giving them a hug? That's awkward. That's weird. But it's when someone does something or someone does something for you or you see someone do something, you go and you kind of take it out of proportion how much you compliment them or thank them for it. That's baseless love. That's free love. That means if someone did something for you, you keep on thanking and praising them for that time and time again. Someone came to help you and to rescue you when you were sick. They gave you, they gave you a gift. They brought you food when you were sick. They did something to help you. You thank them and thank them over and over again. Yeah, maybe I'll deserve those one thank you or one meal when they weren't feeling well. But when you go out of your way to love that person more than they even deserved, that's what Hashem wants to see. I'll end off with one last thing. I don't know. Does everyone have somewhere to go? Are we running anywhere? Let's put this. Let's see everyone on the screen. There's not too many videos. Okay, on. But anyways, does everyone need? Are we, are we running anywhere? I don't know. By me, by me, mean has at seven thirty. I think in Canada it's probably like eight thirty. The fast ends so late. <clears throat> Just to understand what it means, the feeling that a Kadosh Baruch Hu has at his high level, of course, he's at a much higher level. He doesn't really have the feelings, but the way we would perceive his feeling to inspire us to do the right things, listen to the following. We say that we're all children of Hashem, correct? And that makes us all brothers and sisters. When you have children and they are non-stop bickering and fighting or chas shalom, they're even enemies. They don't talk to each other anymore. Chas shalom. What do you feel? It's so bad. It's so horrible. I don't want to mention names. I know a couple. A husband and wife, the sweetest people ever. And they have two of their sons who have not spoken to each other in almost 10 years. Less, a little less than 10 years. Why? They had a sour business dealing between the two and there was definitely money involved and they just completely do not speak to each other ever again. I don't know. I know them. I don't know if they'll ever be able to be put back together. <coughs> but the feeling I've spoken to the mother, such a nice woman, such a pure woman. The sadness that she feels, the incompletion of her life that she feels is second to none. She's broken because of it. That is a fraction of what Hashem feels like every single time another Jew cheats their fellow, lies, hurts, steals, embarrasses, insults, humiliates, you name it. But the feeling that Hashem has when we do good to one another is like that feeling when you're looking at your children from afar and you see them playing in peace. You see them doing good for one another. You see them complimenting each other, being there for each other. That's what we want to do for Hashem. We want to promote ourselves to do good things for one another. To go out of our way to help one another. That's what's going to really reverse this whole chaos. It's going to reverse the chaos of not having the Bet HaMikdash. When we say today, have a meaningful fast, that's what we're supposed to say. Because it's not supposed to be easy. 
We don't have the Beit HaMikdash. It's an imperfect world still. There's a mask on top of this world, on top of our eyes. We can't see truth. Saying an easy fast means I want to get rid of it. I can't wait till it's over. I don't want to suffer. No! We're supposed to have a meaningful fast because the purpose of this fast is to invoke our emotions and inspire us to really turn back to Hashem and say, you know what, I'm going to treat our fellow better. I'm going to learn more Torah. I'm going to fulfill the mitzvot. I'm going to better my ways. In whatever level that I am, I'm just going to go one level higher. One more level. That's all Hashem wants. That's all we could do. So that's all that He wants from us. So my Kadosh Baruch Hu bless us that this will be the last Tisha B'Av that we observe this way. We say it every year. And Bezat Hashem, our prayers will be answered this year. That B'Shana Abba B'Yerushalayim with the Bet HaMikdash in all of its glory. And that we will celebrate Tisha B'Av as it says in the Midrash. Tisha B'Av will be a holiday. We will rejoice in the Bet HaMikdash this holiday very, very speedily. Amen v'amen. Thank you everyone for joining us. If anyone has any questions, I'll stay on for a couple more moments. You can unmute yourself and you can uh, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan is next to me. Call a kavod, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I guess we're good. Don't forget. I have a quick, I have a quick question. Oh, yes. Hey. Hello, hello. So it's, it's, I got on late. Is it recorded? It's recorded, yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks for the recording. Okay. I look forward to listening. Happy to be on even for this small moment. So have a good, easy fast for the rest of the day. And thank you for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Make sure that... Hi, Rabbi, Rabbi, hi. I have a, a quick question. Yes. So um, during during the destruction of the first temple and the second temple, we did uh, some, some say things worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, were there any way for the Jews to repent before Hashem's anger was all over us? Did Hashem give us a way to repent before destruct, destru destroying the temples at all? Or there was no repentance in the heart of the Jews at that time? Well, I'm sure I'm, it's a great question. I'm sure that there were definitely individuals, righteous individuals who, who saw it coming and were repenting, but the overwhelming majority were not there and uh, I guess it pushed it to a point where there the, the Talmud like I said the Talmud goes through different stories or different instances that that's what broke the camel's back one of them was a story of Kamtsa Bar Kamtsa and there's a slew of stories the Talmud gives us of other reasons or, or, or instances which really tipped it over the edge that, that sealed it for the Jewish people that the, tem that the, the temple is going to be destroyed. It wasn't a one of thing. It wasn't like one day everyone was good and then it just switched. No, it was, I'm sure it was years and years and years of torture and mistreating one another. And for the first temple, the three cardinal sins. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so there were certain people that were kind of spared the destruction, the righteous people, or were the righteous people suffering just as much as the non-righteous? So there were plenty, it's a great question. There were plenty righteous individuals and even Talmudic sages who also perished with the destructions of the temple because in a time of wrath, and this became a time of wrath, um, in a time of wrath, the Satan, the Malach HaMavit, sees no, no difference between, between the good and the bad. It's kind of, as we explained over a year ago, the same thing with, with the pandemic, with COVID. There were many great and righteous people that also got it, contracted the virus, and even perished from it. And can we say they deserved it? No, you can't say they deserved it. The world as a whole deserved it to be a, 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 a global pandemic that affected everybody. And because of that, people that deserved it and didn't deserve it were all affected by it. Okay. Okay. I have a question. 
Thank just, you, answer, Thank you just answer one question quick that was put in the chat and then I'm going to take uh, your question, Mrs. Rubenstein. The okay. question is, is, are you allowed to say I love you to someone today? Honestly, today is not the day you're supposed to say I love you to someone. Now I'm going to share something with you. This is brought down. I forget where I read this. I must have read it some time ago. A parent is not a parent. A grandparent's not even supposed to cuddle or, or hug their children today because that brings us joy. And today we're not supposed to do things that bring us joy. You're not supposed to hug and kiss your children today. Now you shouldn't disregard them, has v'shalom, but saying I love you today is not the right thing to do, whether it's to your spouse even, or to your children, or to anybody for that matter. Now, if you didn't know you're not supposed to and you did it, okay, you're learning. It's part of learning. But but today's not the day to, to, to do that, to say that. Okay, Mrs. Rubenstein, you had a question. Yeah, yes, my question is, you mentioned that we are to repair the mistakes and the faults of a generation that preceded us. And I don't know where that comes from because I feel, I, I know that I'm responsible for my mistakes. But why am I supposed to be responsible for my parents, for my ancestors' mistake? And how is that going to bring the gorilla closer? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, Mrs. Rubenstein. Let me, let me uh, explain it a little, a little more in depth. The, uh, the idea is, is that when a person is raised, when a person grows up, they are being formed and developed with certain standards and mindsets that is primarily due to their parents and to the generation that they live in and that generation to the one that preceded it and so on and so forth. As a result of that, normally a child does the same or very similar to that of the previous generation. And because of that, unless they actively choose otherwise, they're going to be following in the same footsteps and they will still be held accountable for the sins of their parents because they're actually doing them also. Even though it may be on autopilot, even though it may be just out of habit. But just because a person was raised that way, it doesn't mean that they're able to continue living that way. They need to challenge. We learned this from Abraham Avinu. We need to challenge our birthplace, our country, our hometown to the, the different spheres that affect us as human beings and challenge, are they moral? Are they ethical in line with what God wants from us with what he, and how he states in the Torah? So how do we rectify the sins of our ancestors is by challenging everything we do and looking and saying, is this right? Is this according to halakha? Is this according to what Hashem wants? If it is, continue. And if it's not, then start learning and bettering our ways for that. And my, my, to finish my question is, we have had 2,000 years of rectification, and I, I don't want to be pessimist, but it seems like it's a mission impossible, you know, to fix such an enormous task. You know, that's, that's the feeling I have today on the Shabbat Ab, I'm not happy. <laughs> I, I, could, I could tell you I share the same feeling I share a feeling on one hand of hopelessness. If the previous great generations or the great leaders couldn't have brought it, how come can we? But one thing I heard, and I don't remember in, in the name of which rabbi or one thing I must have read, Chazal tell us that Hashem judges every generation on their level. Hashem does not gen judge us and our capabilities to the levels of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and Moshe Rabbeinu, and David Amelech, and all of the great sages of the previous generations. Not even that of the Hafez Chaim, or the Ben Ishchai, or the Arizal. No. <clears throat> Hashem is judging this generation, the generation of 2021, or better, the generation of 5781, based on our, sorry to say, low level. Every little bit that we do is light years of, of a step compared to the previous generations because of our low level, unfortunately. So it doesn't mean that we cannot bring it because we're not as great as the previous generations as because it's been so long. On the contrary, it's a compound 
of the efforts of the previous generations that may add to it. And it will be our measly efforts, which, which, which are so hard for us, which are measly in the grand scheme of things, yet mean so much to Hashem because he sees our, our full effort into it. That's what will bring the rebuilding of the third Betamik Dash. Thank you. Amen. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, any last questions? <clears throat> Just one last thing, Rabbi. So when do we uplift the um, restrictions? Can you just go through that with us for tonight and up until tomorrow? So according to the Sephardic tradition, here, let me pull it up. <clears throat> <clears throat> uh, okay after the fast is done according to the Sephardic tradition all restrictions are left are, are uplifted sorry except for eating meat and drinking wine and listening to music so Sephardim are not able to again eat meat drink wine or listen to music until sunset the following day. Um, the Ashkenaz tradition, however, is they, I believe they don't even do laundry until midday the next day, and they won't cut their hair at least till midday the next day. Svaradim already from tonight to tomorrow morning, we can go and we can already cut their hair or shave. But the Ashkenazim take those, those two and they prolong it an extra till the midday of the following day. But just again, clearly no meat or wine or music until tomorrow evening. And both um, Ashkenazim and Sephardim, like Ashkenazim also don't listen to music until tomorrow night? Yeah, yeah. Okay, very well. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Bezrat Hashem HaKadosh Baruch Hu will take our prayers, our fast, and our uh, intentions to connect to something which is so far from us, but through the lamentations, through the, uh, through the kinot that we read today, through Echa, through the prayers, Maybe Kadosh Baruch Hu will help us connect to something which is so foreign to us, just like that 13 year old boy who never met his mom yet still says Kaddish with no emotion. Maybe we could have a little bit of emotion, a little bit of connection through the past hour and a half of Divre Torah, Divre Hitorerut that we shared with everyone. So, next year in Yerushalayim, all together, parting, rejoicing with the building of the Beit HaMikdash. Amen, Amen. Hope to see everyone Wednesday night, Bezrat Hashem, for the class on the Parashat HaShavua, Parashat Vet Hanan, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. You're welcome.